All right, everybody, welcome to Real Progressives. This is Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. And before we get started and before I get to introduce my guest, I just want to thank everybody for their support. Um, tonight, it's going to be a really, really fun night. We're bringing back Claire Connolly of Renegade Inc., um, who we've had on the show previously some time ago. Um, and it's really exciting to have her back because just recently, Claire was on the Lee Camp Redacted Tonight Show. So we got to hear some MMT and some heterodox economics go across on Lee Camp, which for those of you who've known how hard we've tried to get Lee to pay attention to this stuff, it was a huge win. We were all clapping in the background. And uh, so it's with great pleasure that I'm going to bring out my guest. Uh, without further ado, further ado bring on, bring on. Claire Connolly. Welcome. Claire Connolly. Welcome to the Hi, thanks for having me back. All right. So, so tell us what have you been up to? What's been going on at Renegating? Well, we've just been riding up a storm and recording up a storm. Um, Renegating, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is a relatively new publication. Um, we're really dedicated to examining the myths of both money and history that have led to the current political crisis and explaining the particular pieces of either legislation or um, the structure of the economy that has led to uh, a rise in unemployment, a devaluation of wages, um, the, the subsequent uh, political alienation that has happened on both sides of the political divide or all sides of the political divide because it doesn't really seem as though it's simply left versus right anymore. And our job is to examine the problems and propose alternatives. And we want people to understand that there is more than one way to skin a cat, proverbially speaking. And we want to start to examine the economic alternatives that can allow people to support themselves, that can cover the cost of living, can empower people both culturally, politically, as well as financially. And we hope that people would understand that a lot of the cultural tensions that we are experiencing today is a symptom of a much broader problem. So we want to be able to holistically examine a range of solutions to a number of problems that are probably grounded in finance and economics, but that have all sorts of repercussions from social and cultural to socioeconomic and political. Um, so we have just been building up the site and riding up a storm, and I hope that everyone is reading and watching our videos and, and reading the content that we're creating because uh, we're having a, a great time uh, trying to, to help people understand the range of alternatives that are on the table. Okay, so, okay, so with, I'm going to go ahead and mute you for a moment so we don't have the echo. So one of the things that was very exciting to me when we first started talking was you wrote this really, really incredible piece that a UBI was not the answer, that a job was what we needed, a federal job guarantee was what we needed. And you, you it was a really, really phenomenal piece. And now we're talking, and you, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about a potential way of looking at basic income that maybe others hadn't considered before. So I'm going to let you talk about that moment. Talk about that moment, too. Okay, you want me to you want me to just jump in? I do. I really do. Yes. Okay. So um, for for those who have not been initiated, a UBI is a universal basic income, and it's designed to act either as a partial or whole substitute for social spending. Um, people who consider themselves to be particularly left of center, I guess, see it as a means to supplement or completely replace employment because I think a lot of people that sit towards the left of the divide feel as though employment is a concept that is to be left in the past. And as technology and outsourcing devalues labor and replaces it all together, um, some people on the left have the idea that maybe unemployment is an, sorry, some people on the left believe that unemployment, that employment <laughs> is an antiquated issue. Um, some people on the right believe that a universal basic income is an excellent replacement for social spending because it actually means that there's less money being spent on social services and that aligns ideologically 
um, with the idea that the less money they can throw at a problem, the better, because generally some conservatives at least tend to believe that it is not the government's place to address employment as a whole or even the social issues that stem from unemployment. Um, those of us who sit perhaps more to the centre that is neither left nor right believe that a universal basic income might be one part of a range of solutions that can address issues that stem from unemployment and underemployment. But I would like to personally emphasize that I do not think that it is a replacement either for social spending or for employment. We all know that unemployment is a rising problem. Um, underemployment is an even bigger problem. Um, we're seeing right now a lot of people having to take on a number of part-time jobs just to put bread on the table. Um, and a universal basic income would mean that people, regardless of your political persuasion, your age, your skill level, your capability, your employment status or your health status, if everyone gets a certain amount of money each month from the government, that can certainly ease some of the stresses that we all have to face, either with paying rent or mortgages, food, school fees, taxes, all of the stuff that we as adults have to deal with. Um, but I would be loath to see the universal basic income replace employment because I do not believe that employment is a thing of the past. I think that employment has a number of virtues, not just the ability to support oneself. It is a way that people earn meaning for their lives. It's where we meet our friends. It's where a lot of us meet our partners. It's where we get our sense of self-worth. And so the idea to me that we can simply leave employment behind is something that used to work but no longer does because it's just actually not worth the time cost ratio, I think is tends to have the potential to be a utopian idea. The role of a government is to plan an economy based on the needs of those people that elect it. Corporations do not vote. Businesses do not vote. Only individuals can vote. And so the idea that a government has abdicated its responsibility for employment is a very popular idea in neoliberal thought. So to me, simply throwing money at something is a lazy alternative to actually fixing the root causes of structural unemployment. And I think this is potentially where a universal basic income can come in. But why, if we're going to spend that money anyway, why not spend it in a way that is structured, that guarantees affirmative employment for the greatest number of people with the least amount of energy, that means that most people can support themselves, can put food on the table, can pay their own taxes. The, you know, employment is a concept that is agreeable to all people of almost all political persuasions because it almost... It, it meets everybody's needs. You know, for those who are opposed to simply throwing money at issues, employment is the answer to that particular issue. And for those of us on the left who believe that the government needs to take a more affirmative role in ensuring that most people that they represent have jobs, can pay taxes and pay for their own stuff, that also suits their political ideology as well. So having a structural form of a universal basic income to me brings it far closer to what looks like a job guarantee program where the public sector becomes the employer of last resort is a far greater alternative than simply throwing money at a problem. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm going to mute you because we have a little bit of feedback. I'm going to speak real quick. So one of the things that I think is very important in what you said was that you know we, we've talked at length here about the balance of basic income versus job guarantee, but in the United States, we have something, for example, called Social Security. And Bernie Sanders ran on the idea of expanding Social Security. The opportunity exists to provide Social Security to those who don't want a job or who are unable to have a job, et cetera. But I think one of the most ex exciting things about those who advocate for a job guarantee is the concept of federally funding it through the sovereign 
while administering it locally to address the very real needs of local communities. And what is really special to me about that, for many people, they don't realize that this is a tremendous intersectional moment where communities that are different than, say, rural America or urban America or whatever, they can design these jobs to meet their local needs. And, you know, we, we talked at length about what what is falling apart in America, for example, and I know this is a global problem, so I don't want it to be too American centric. But when you look for the last 40 years, America has let itself fall to pieces. We haven't invested in anything. Our bridges are crumbling and falling apart. Our schools are still with that old like lead tiles. I mean, like fallout shelter, 1940s kind of schools. And I mean, we just are not, if we spent the money to upkeep this, the jobs, the we have so much work out there for blue collar people in particular, this idea of a basic income would go right out the window. The problem is, is that we've created this need by starving America, by starving all the countries around the world with this neoliberal push. So I, I think sometimes we forget, and this is what you said that hit home so much, We've ignored the structural problems and we go for the lazy man's way out by trying to push this basic income idea and just throw money at the problem. But the reality is it's not the money we need so much as we need housing, we need clothing, we need food, we need health care. We need these things and those things without an anchor to the price, there's no guarantee they threw enough money at you to be able to make that basic income worthwhile. Now I'm going to mute out and let you fill in there. You know, I think one of the biggest contradictions of the current political age is the tagline, Make America Great Again, because it refers to a nostalgia for a period in the past of implied prosperity, right? We all go, well, you know, we want to go back to the 1950s and 60s or 70s even, you know, when things seemed to be easier, when things were less complicated, stuff was more affordable, there were more jobs, et cetera, et cetera. The irony of that phrase is that it's nostalgic for a period in time that was the direct beneficiary of a job guarantee program. The only reason that America and Australia and the UK and pretty much the entire developed world at least, probably to uh, the detriment of, of developing nations, the prosperity that we experience is a direct result of the New Deal, which was a program implemented by Roosevelt to pull America out of the Great Depression. And the prosperity that America and the world experienced is a direct result of this job guarantee program because they needed to rebuild after the war. And so the government stepped in to say, we will be the employer of last resort. Every man and woman is entitled to work it is a fundamental basic human right. And even the prosperity that we were experiencing in the late 80s, early 90s is a direct result of that program. So it's kind of, there's this direct contradiction in this idea of make America great again, because it's nostalgic for a time where a job guarantee existed, but it's claiming that it wants to use neoliberal policies, which stands in direct opposition to the very results that that program created. So I think we need to, to understand where that prosperity came from. It came from the government stepping in to actually ensure that every man and woman had the ability to earn a living and earn a wage that supported the cost of living. So the government right now, both American and the UK and Australia and Canada, for example, really need to spend more time meditating on that contradiction. You cannot solve an issue of make America great again with neoliberal politics. And let's not forget, Roosevelt was subject to a potential fascist coup for trying to implement the New Deal. Both the Democrats and the Republicans tried to literally overthrow him with the funding of some of the greatest financial institutions in the world because they believed that that program was a threat to the aristocracy. Winston Churchill in the UK was similarly subject to an attempted coup, to a coup attempt that was staged and almost implemented by financial aristocrats. So, you know, let's take a step back and understand that every single piece of progress that has been achieved 
economically and financially over the last 50 years are the result of outliers like Roosevelt, who was prepared to defy his own party for the betterment of the people he was elected to represent. Roosevelt, back in the age of the New Deal, was the equivalent of what Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn are today. And I think we forget that because history has been kinder to Roosevelt than you know, more modern history has been to either of these two candidates. And maybe that's because maybe we're too close to it. I don't know. You know, only time will be able to tell. But I think it's really important that we remember history accurately because how are we meant to learn from those lessons if we're buying into the mythologies that have been created around them, which encourage people to ignore the actual foundations of what was on the table at the time? I was talking into the mute, I, into the mute, I think. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear a word you were saying. <laughs> it was a really good rant. I was sitting there saying, we've been trying our best to build this economy back up, when in reality, during World War II, we had a tremendous, I mean, the economy was through the roof. The, the factories were at full tilt. Mo women were working, men were working, kids were working. We had to sell war bonds to slow the economy down. It was just incredible. Here we are now. We're once again using the military industrial complex as the employer of last resort, as our engine, our economic engine uh, to drive the economy, whether it was Vietnam, whether it has been Iraq, whether it was the Cold War. We've always used these things to do this when we have a social agenda that we could easily implement that everyone would benefit from if we just re-envisioned what the public purpose was instead of being focused purely on the military, focus it on our, our families and our children and our planet. It just seems like a no-brainer to me. A time when the public sector is badly in need of fresh ideas and fresh blood flowing through its veins. Um, you know, it seems as though every second day we're, we're hearing stories about public sector stuff ups, particularly, you know, in IT. If, if you're down in Australia, you know, there isn't a day that goes by where we don't hear stories about some kind of IT problem that, that, that was basically the result of, of warring departments with antiquated ideas about how technology works. But to your point, America already has a job guarantee program and that is through the military. And from my understanding, you don't necessarily need to be serving 
in order to be a part of that program. There are plenty of, of other jobs that you can do within the military that doesn't require you to visit the Middle East or, or serve on the front line. And there are a whole bunch of services. You know, the DOCS, for example, the Department of Child Services, is one of the most underfunded areas that of the public sector that exists in, in modern history. And, and that case is so in Australia, in the UK, in the US, you know, you continually hear stories of these kids who are falling through the gaps because nobody is bothered to come by and actually do the check on the family. And the result is more often than not more domestic abuse than should really exist, particularly for families who are receiving checks from the government in order to take in and care for children. But, you know, a lot of these systems are still paper systems. They're not even digitized. So regardless of, of being able to have enough people to go and actually visit these people's homes and ensure that these children are being raised safely, that they're going to school every day, that there's enough food on the table, that their literacy and numeracy is up to scratch, just the digital systems that could provide those checks, there aren't enough resources there either. So there are a whole bunch of areas within the public sector that are massively underfunded that a job guarantee program could address. And to that point, a universal basic income is inadequate in that it doesn't at the moment, well, it doesn't exist very much at the moment outside of some small pocket programs in Denmark, I think, and in some other areas of Europe. But outside of that, the ideology of a universal basic income doesn't really account for longevity of skills. We're living to 100, maybe more now, and a lot of people aren't going to be able to afford to retire at 65, 70, you know, even outside of the fact that the retirement age keeps getting increased year on year because it turns out the government realises they can't afford to pay it out when it actually is expected. If we're living longer, we need to have skills that last us two, three lifetimes compared to the kinds of programs that existed post-war when we were still dying between the ages of 65 and 85. You know, to make it to 95, even 30 years ago, was an anomaly. And today it's common. So we need the kinds of jobs programs that ensures that we have transferable skills so that we can support ourselves. If you believe that it is not the government's job to fund the social safety net or to structure a program to take care of those kinds of things, then you need to ensure that the people you represent have the, the skills that allows you to avoid continuing to focus on those kinds of things. You can't say, well, you don't have the skills and you don't have the job and we don't want to spend the money, so please go and be homeless. Because in reality, that just means there's more money that the government has to spend dealing with the social problems that result from unemployment. Even if you are a staunch neoliberal, there is political and financial incentive for government to ensure that people have skills that allows them to earn their own money. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be a matter of whether this is left or right. This is just basic economic pragmatism. So if you don't want to spend on the social safety net, at least to the extent that is currently being spent, which in my opinion is not nearly enough, but let's, let's look at it from another point of view. If you believe that the social safety net is overfunded and is not the role of the government to take care of, then you need to create a solution to that. And the solution to that is employment. And if the private sector isn't going to create that employment, then the public sector does need to step in. And if the private sector has a problem with that, their remedy to that is to employ people. Like, it, it, it's pretty simple when you actually think about the nuts and bolts of it. So I want to say something here real quick, Claire. One of the biggest things that drives my ship every day is that my son is on the spectrum. He has autism. And the funding that it would take to have the kind of therapy day in and day out that he would actually need to fulfill his grand ability, the, the ultimate possibilities of his life. We get two hours a week of therapy. And if you've ever been with a child that has spectrum issues, you understand everything from textures with eating and speaking and all the other sensory issues that go with that require an incredible amount of help. We don't fund schools that actually are capable of dealing with autism, which is all too regular nowadays. We don't fund 
things like that. And these, the amount of care jobs that would come from that is unbelievable. But the reason why I bring this up is this. When you understand state theory of money and you understand that the money comes from the state, that the alternative is bank debt or IOUs from the bank denominated in the government's unit account, the trade-off there is ridiculous. Why in the world would you put the onus on the people to somehow or another bear the weight of the economy when the reality is the money comes freely from the government? It doesn't make any sense to me. And that, to me, is where the real stumbling block is. Because many of the people that feel we're spending too much money on these services believe that because they believe it's their hard-earned tax dollar that's going to it. And they look at their paychecks and they see a bunch of money missing. And then they look over at these services and they say, we got to cut these services. They're lazy. They're no good. They're ne'er-do-goods. And I think that that right there, before you even worry about what you're spending on, if you eradicate that myth right there and just start talking about what is the public purpose, I think it changes and it's no longer a partisan issue. Now it's just a human issue. It's interesting that you say that because actually, you know, we've talked about the job guarantee program through the US military, but America and Australia and the UK has another job guarantee program in the form of private subsidies. It is correct to say that many in the middle class are paying too many taxes, but part of the reason that they're paying too many taxes is that the 1% and the 0.1 of the 1% aren't paying any taxes at all whatsoever. And so the middle class, the upper middle class, the middle class, the lower middle class and the working class are paying a greater proportion of their taxes to make up for that fact. But there's a contradiction here because in the financial sector and particularly in the technology sector, we celebrate spectrum issues. You know, we look at people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and go, you know, they were brilliant people that were on the spectrum that created these amazing things. But the only thing that allowed them to be successful were, one, coming from families that allowed them to have a safety net in case things failed, and two, was a safety net created by the government for the corporations that these people worked for. You know, it, it, it's kind of ironic that the government's, like to say things like corporate tax cuts create jobs when a lot of these tax cuts are going to corporations that don't pay tax at all in the first place. So how are you meant to create jobs with a tax cut that for tax that you're not paying? It doesn't make any sense. And another job guarantee program exists in the form of CEO bonuses. I'm sure you're probably aware, Stephen, that the bailout for the banks that were issued under Obama went to profit margins and they went to CEO bonuses. They didn't help people keep their houses. They didn't help people deal with the mounting debt that they had to do, that they had to pay. It, it went to, to boost the incomes of already wealthy people. So the idea that a job guarantee is a radical idea is a bit of a misnomer because it already exists. It just exists for people that don't need it. So now why not take just a modicum of the same amount of money that you're already giving to the corporate sector in the form of subsidies and tax cuts and, and well, you know, direct payments and use that to ensure that the rest of us can afford to buy the things that these corporations are creating. If you're not going to give them a job, then at least give them more income to be able to spend on the stuff that we need. It's interesting that you say that because part of me thinks that the object of, of these sorts of spending ideas, going back to Milton Friedman, many of the center right and, and far right libertarians and others that buy into the whole quantity theory of money and, and really want to enhance capitalism, cut all regulations and just let it go unfettered, those folks look at a negative income tax, going back to Friedman's early days, and, and say, hey, here's a great way to give a basic income because they believed, number one, let's get rid of all safety nets. Let's give them some money. Let's just throw some money at them and then let them figure out what to do with it because they're bright and we'll just enhance capitalism that way. So <clears throat> when I look at people that are championing this UBI, I, I mean, the unfettered, the UBI of Scott Santons and some of these other folks out there that are UBI or busters, they're not even thinking this through. They only want a UBI, period. 
when I talk to them and I explain to them that there is no price anchor to the needs of the people. There's nothing that is guaranteed. I, I compare it to a school voucher. In the United States, many people would like to give vouchers out so people can pick what school they want to go to. But when you think about that, if everybody gets this $5,000 voucher, then what you've done is you've created status quo again, because now what's going to happen is the wealthy will self-select to another wealthy school where they can be amongst people that they feel comfortable being around. And then the poor will be left with the poor people once again. And nothing has changed except the wealthy pay less for the school than they did before. And so to me, it seems like this is more of the same thing where we're not really giving them anything because there's no inflation constraint there. There's nothing there to stop the price from going up. But within the job guarantee, by structuring things around labor and providing the benefits that go with a federal job, for example, in the United States, if you get the job guarantee, you get the federal job benefits. All of a sudden now you've created a new wage floor. Now you've gotten rid of a, the uh, minimum wage. You've created a whole new situation where in order to hire people out of the job guarantee, they've got to meet or beat something. Basic income, that could actually subsidize crap wages. That doesn't actually do for us what we'd like it to do. And, and these people are religiously addicted to UBI, and they don't think it through, and it drives me crazy, and then they get mad at me for, for laying it out there to them. But the reality is, is that it's not a good solution on its own. Basic income has the potential to be a good solution. I don't want to throw stones at people who are trying to fix the problem. Their intent is good. I think the danger here, as with almost all issues, is that people think of one issue in a vacuum and they assume that everyone agrees with all of the implications that come along with that, even if they're not explicitly talking about what those implications are. Sorry, I'm just gonna switch my phone off. Um, people on the right like to think that everyone believes that a universal basic income is good because it means that less money gets to be paid into social welfare. People on the left believe that the universal income is good because it means that we no longer have to worry about employment as the main form of income. Both of those ideas are deeply flawed and deeply incorrect and come with a bunch of implications that aren't really being talked about. The, prob the danger with the universal basic income is that they can go, here's your $1,500 a month, but by the way, um, you now have to use that money to pay for your Medicare, for your healthcare, for your education, for all of the things that were currently being subsidized under Social Security. If that disappears, the universal basic income exists, but it's being paid back into the system that's creating the problems in the first place. You need a system that has affordable health care, competitive education that is incredibly affordable for the people and incredibly expensive for government. You need to, well, you need to be able to measure the health of the economy on consumer confidence instead of the, the fluctuations of the market. And these are all things that exist outside of whether we have a universal basic income or not. But I think people need to understand that a UBI has the potential to destroy the safety net and defeat the purpose that a universal basic income exists to address in the first place. And if people are spending the money being given to them by the government back on rent, mortgages, debt, what is the point? The money is still going to enhance the income of people who don't even need it in the first place. So whether we have a job guarantee program or whether it exists in the form of a universal basic income, it needs to be structured in a way that keeps money flowing in and out of the economy, that empowers people to be able to afford the very basic necessities, a roof over their head, food on the table, and the kind of education that makes them employable in the long term. Outside of that, it would be very nice for people to be able to save for a rainy day because we all have emergencies where our car breaks down or God forbid we get sick. You know, people need to have some money put aside to deal with that, particularly in America, because your healthcare costs are exponentially more expensive than anywhere else in the world. A universal basic income isn't going to address that one way or the other. But you want, if you are going to have one, you need to ensure that all of these other things are protected. Otherwise, you've basically got the system that we have now. 
except that you're being given a pittance by the government that's going to fund the thing that's already being funded through Social Security, except now we're paying into it directly instead of the government structuring a program to ensure all of these things are affordable. It, that's absolutely spot on, Claire. Um, I want to ask you real quickly. So obviously there are a million ways to skin a cat. And that's one of the things I really like about Renegade Inc. is that you guys are willing to look at things from a, a real honest 360 perspective. Um, one of the things that, that jumped out at me, though, was when me and you were talking prior to going live, you had talked about the combination of a land value tax, which is a Georgist perspective, and using that as a means of offsetting a UBI. Um, and and there, even though I'm not for a UBI on its own, there's some merit in what you were saying there. And I'd like you to give you an opportunity uh, to talk about that. Also, we know that the rentier economy is one of the biggest detriments to economic growth right now because almost everything is being commodified and debts generally go to some form of rentier, whether that's a bank loan, whether that's the rent on your house, the rent on your, the, the tax on your land, um, the mortgages that you're paying. Most of the money that is being paid right now goes to pay off some kind of debt. And the danger with the universal basic income is that that money is just going to flow straight back into the hands of property owners and um, and landowners and any form of, of rentier economy that currently exists right now. A universal basic income does not need to be funded through tax. I want to say that right up the top as a caveat. That being said, it would be complementary to the goals that a universal basic income is designed to address, to fund it through a land value tax, to ensure that money is not flowing directly into the coffers of property owners, of debtors, of financial institutions. Because there's a risk that if you had an unstructured universal basic income, the kind that is being suggested by many who sit to the right of the political spectrum, that's just a way of ensuring that more money flows to the people who are currently collecting rent off the rest of us right now. And I think you'll agree with me, Stephen, that that would just create more problems than it actually addresses. So there is a suggestion that you could fund a universal basic income of land value tax rather than property tax because the value of the house and the value of the land are two very different things. Um, it might be a way to ensure that um, you can control the value of property, to ensure that we don't have a continuity of the, the property crisis and, and housing crisis that exists right now. It creates a new threshold for the value of both rent and of the, the cost of a property. Um, and it ensures that money is flowing in and out of the economy in a way that supports the greatest ability to support oneself for the greatest amount of people with the least amount of effort. That is unlikely to happen because the current economy supports the rentiers of the world and not the rentees or the debtees. Um, but these are things that we need to think about when we're talking about a universal basic income because it has the potential to be a wolf in sheep's clothing because it sounds great on paper if you don't look at the implications of what lies underneath, what sits in the small print. This could just be a very clever way of paying more rents to people than is currently being paid right now. So funding it off a land value tax ensures that that doesn't happen in a nutshell. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to read a, um, a clip from a, a, a great article uh, called Universal Basic Income is a Neoliberal Plot to Make You Poor. And it's uh, new thinking for the British economy, open democracy. And I found it interesting. I'm going to read this to you to fuel a little bit more of our discussion and see what your take on this is. Um, if you listen to the way I say it, I'm just read it out loud here. It says, the reason many people on the left are excited about proposals such as a universal basic income is that they acknowledge economic inequality 
and its social consequences. However, a closer look at how UBI is expected to work reveals that it is intended to provide political cover for the elimination of social programs and the privatization of social services. The Liberal Party's resolution is no exception, calling for savings in health, justice, education, and social welfare, as well as the building of self-reliant tax-paying citizens, clearly means social cuts and privatization. So to me, that right there, that right there is why I can't embrace it. I can't get past it. I can't get past it. I can't get past it. It just seems like a really impractical idea. Like if we're going to throw money at a problem, why not do it in a way that is structured and actually solves a bunch of problems? It seems as though the universal basic income appeals to people who don't like to think of the idea that the government is responsible for employment. They're uncomfortable with the idea that the government needs to step in to solve financial and economic issues. My personal view is if that's the case, why don't we just abolish governments altogether and start to elect the CEOs of Goldman and Sachs? I mean, if, if the government's job isn't to take care of employment, then what does it exist to do except to fund subsidies and ensure that they flow to the corporate sector? Which, again, if, if that's the case, then corporations should be the ones that are voting, not people. But government, by definition, was by the people for the people. Why are we wasting all of this money on huge, expensive election campaigns if the end result is not to benefit the people who elect government? So, I mean, that, that, that's a problem in and of itself. The government has, and we have given the government permission to abdicate its responsibility for employment. This is a relatively new phenomenon. And it's one that... I'm deeply surprised by its popularity because it seems as though people on both sides of the political aisle are very comfortable with this idea now. And then that in itself has all sorts of implications because then really this is why organisations like the EU and the IMF and the World Bank and the millions and billions of dollars of consultants that are employed by these organisations have more power than the governments themselves which is why Europe finds itself in such a huge conundrum. It's why the Catalans were not allowed to secede from Spain. Because if that happens, what's to stop Greece from pulling out of the EU? What's to stop Lithuania? You know, there are a whole bunch of countries that would probably like to have their central banks back and have control over their own currencies again. Because unless you're France or Germany, the EU has not necessarily been that beneficial to these smaller member nations. Um, and, you know, it's why we've seen these huge Greek bailouts, which on the surface look as though it's a bailout for the Greek economy when really it's a bailout for French and German banks in disguise because they can't call it what it is without fear of losing power and losing at the next election. So, again, I think America in particular and America's, conservatives are very good at giving very, very effective and appealing sounding names to things like death tax, for example. But it doesn't, by definition, describe what it is, because if it described what it is, I think people would have a lot more questions about how it actually operates. So we need to be careful with the labels that we give things and we need to ensure that we give all of these issues the time and attention that it needs. And we need to ensure that it reaches the right people so that more of us are actually engaged and involved in the process and understand the implications of all of these big decisions that are being made on our behalf, a lot of the time without our permission. Um, and I've said this before in, in a number of the things that I've written, but it is our threshold for this kind of BS that is keeping this system afloat. The only reason that a wage was created at all, let alone a minimum wage, was to prevent the overthrow of government. Once people realise that, I think they'll realise they have a lot more power to influence political change and economic and financial change than they're giving themselves credit for. So okay. I think we just need to continue to very carefully and meticulously examine these ideas. 
without throwing stones at the people that are suggesting these ideas like a universal basic income because it's designed to be deceptive and while a lot of us are discussing it as though it's well intentioned and it has the potential to be let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater and let's not alienate people who would like to be a part of the solution so I want to bring up something here in terms of you it was a beautiful statement you made and it was talking about the corporations and how you know, Germany, et cetera, have been boisted. Their, their banks have been lifted up, really, is what it's we're talking about with Greece, et cetera. And, and this plays into the Marxist side, the left wing side of assessing the relationship between, quote unquote, labor and capital. And you start looking, you realize that part of their distrust of government isn't just because Marx said it 350,000 years ago before Methuselah. It's because it's happening right here in front of us that governments are not protecting the people, governments are protecting corporations, and they're protecting these large wealth owners as opposed to the people. So it really is a hidden serfdom. I mean, you've really created a, a, a slavery that has been very, very hidden, very stealth mode, and 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 it's quite obvious. And, and part of it is just like anybody on a plantation, if they're kept ignorant and they're kept unaware of their power and they're kept completely un, you know, out of the loop as to what is going on, they will go along to get along because that's the only reality they know. But when you expose them, and this is what we're trying to do repeatedly is expose people to these economic truths, these economic lenses, these perspectives so that people own their power instead of waiting for some politician to decide it's okay. That's my biggest fault with the Sanders folks, even my friends in the Sanders movement. If Bernie didn't say it, it ain't so. So they're willing to live in this paradigm that's waiting for him to give them the okay. And that right there is unsustainable because the things that we need to do require us to be bigger and badder than any politician and any political structure. We need to be united to be able to push these and no longer accept it. That was the key that you said, we accept this stuff. If we stopped accepting it, they would literally have a choice of having to either serve the people or deal with tremendous unrest. What are your thoughts on that? I always say if the people that showed up to the Women's March showed up to vote, we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. And it wouldn't necessarily be Hillary that would have won in the end. You know, voting is the greatest form of protest in the world. And right now, it's still effective. It has the potential not to be. The power of the vote, there have been significant attempts to degrade the power of our vote over time. And I think that belief is what is discouraging people from showing up on election day. But if we're going to show up to these women's marches and if we're going to occupy Wall Street and we're going to have all of these counter establishment kind of movements, you know what's more effective than all of those things? Showing up to vote, doing a voter drive. Um, you know, and, and to the people who are sort of, you know, economic skeptics or, you know, who sit on the right of the political divide, I want to say to those people, you don't really have to sacrifice anything. We could continue with the same subsidies for the corporate sector that exist right now. None of that has to stop because the government creates the money. All we're asking is for the same kind of subsidies that flow to the corporate sector to flow to the people who vote and who pay taxes and who work jobs. And without those jobs, these goods and services wouldn't exist. You don't have to pay more tax even. You could give everyone in the country a massive tax cut, including the 1%, and the economy would improve. The only thing that we're asking for is equality of subsidy, really, is what this is about. The only issue that the private sector and, and economic conservatives would have with either a job guarantee or a universal basic income is that the floor for a minimum wage would increase. And that is the sticking point. That is the point where they go, well, that's going to cost us more, even if we're going to get millions of dollars in subsidies towards the end of the year. I mean, right now, the government is paying corporations to create jobs. You know, a lot of these jobs are already government subsidized. It's not being paid for out of the coffers of these corporations. And if you're a bank, your losses aren't being paid for by 
your coffers either. They're being paid for by the government. I mean, that's a really dangerous situation to be in. There's no incentive to not commit white collar crime because they know it's not going to be investigated. And even if it is investigated, it's not going to be prosecuted. And even if it is prosecuted, it's going to be the fine that's the equivalent of a dollar. And it seldom even gets to that point in the first place. So we've literally got a system that encourages widespread financial malfeasance with subsidies and tax cuts and direct payments on top of that, that's a very dangerous system because you're literally saying you have permission to commit fraud without consequence. So, you know, that needs to be dealt with in and of itself. But on top of that, even if you don't want to deal with those issues, fine. But let's just have equality of spending for public and private. For, for individuals and corporations, you know, if you're going to to give Microsoft or Apple a massive multi-million dollar subsidy, why is that okay because it's a company and why is it not okay because it's an individual? Because individuals are the people that create businesses and create companies. They start with one person or maybe two people. You don't have a company without people, not yet anyway. We are not at the point where a robot can go, I have a really great idea. And I can do it all myself and I don't need to employ anyone. I don't need to ask any questions. You know, I can just generate it myself because I'm a great piece of AI. And even when we talk about these kind of uh, conversations about technology replacing workers, people tend to ignore computers still need upkeep. You still need somebody to write the programs that power the artificial intelligence in the first place. You need patches to be able to ensure that these systems are secure over time. You need people to fix the machines. That all requires employment. We are not yet at a point where a computer program can write itself into existence and fix all of the problems along the way. Not to mention, these robots have to get to people's businesses and homes. That requires transport. That also requires warehouses for them to be stored in before they are transported. You need people to drive these trucks. And even if you don't and you have driverless trucks, those trucks need to be designed and built and upkept as well. So there are all these forms of human skill that go into creating the technology that's supposedly replacing us in the first place. And it's a total misnomer. At no point can technology truly replace human ability because guess what? Humans create technology. So if, if this is the case, then we need a system that is equitable so that all of us can afford to continue to have the skills to contribute to the economy. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I want to say one thing before I let you get, we're, we got a couple minutes left and I want to give you the last word, but you were on with Lee camp as we started the show off. And that's a really, really big deal for us for, for the tons and tons of people that watch our shows that actually take the Twitter and take, to all these different mediums, YouTube and, and Facebook, we've been after people like Jimmy Dore, Lee Camp, Tim Black, who had me on originally, but hasn't in a while. These are individuals that have tremendously large audiences for alternative media purposes and, and really, really could help empower people to have this knowledge in their hands so they could do something and really activate on this knowledge. You were there, and I can't tell you how much that made my heart sing and how much that made most of the volunteers at Real Progressive sing. I think everybody was excited. I, I, I must have had that interview forwarded to me a hundred times, Say, oh, my God, oh, my God, Lee finally had someone talking about MMT, talking about real sovereign economics, man. You've got to see this. And I look, I was like, that's clear. That's great. That's awesome. So talk to me a little bit about what it was like to be on with Lee Camp. Lee Camp. I'm a big Lee fan. I've been following his work for, for some time. Um, I was very surprised when they approached me for an interview because I kind of felt like I should be the one interviewing him, not the other way around. So I was very flattered to be on the show. Um, it was a little shorter than I would have liked. You know, it's really hard to fit that much information into a 15 minute segment. So we crammed a lot in. We, we covered a lot in, in a very short space of time. It was a great interview and I hope you'll have me on again. Well, you'll be back you're with us, I hope. With us, I hope. Um, we got a little echo. Um, we got a little echo. Second. Second. 
Um, I, I'm hoping that we'll have you back on again soon because one of the things that is really, really nice with what we're trying to do, at least I think it's nice, it makes me feel good anyway, is we're trying to demonstrate that the issues that we see in the United States are the issues that are happening around the world and that so much of the problems that are in the UK right now and quite frankly, even in Australia are in large result a... a, a USA is a net importer, but we're a net exporter of American exceptionalism. And one of the things we seem to like to export is this neoliberal urge to privatize. And, and so, you know, having people like yourself on that can help us see that international view so we don't stay tunnel vision, USA, 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 I think it's a really, really important thing. We're, we're one global community. We may have different currencies but we have a similar need and we have similar rules and expectations that we can have. And, and, and it's good to know that the United States doesn't have it right. It's good to know that the suffering we have is optional and we can look across the pond or down under and see you guys doing it better than us, quite frankly. So I want to thank you for joining us and I'll give you the last word. Look, I think it's, it's easy to, think as though the grass is greener. I mean, I think it's fair to say Australia has a much better health system than America does because it's subsidised um, and the ability to go to the doctor and not pay anything is a really big part of Australian identity. It was actually, you know, the, the, the Liberal government during the last election proposed a, a $20 copay um, for people who wanted to go to a GP um, and Labor, the Labor government successfully ran what it called a Medicare campaign because it was seen as the first step towards privatization. And the only refuge that the Liberal Party had was to say, well, we're not really privatizing Medicare, we're just privatizing the administration of Medicare, which is like, really, like that, that's the, the leg that you're going to go out on. Um, but it's really important to understand that Australia is very, very close to trying to implement the same kinds of health and education systems that exist in the US. And America is being seen as a, a, an imprint to be replicated in Australia, for, particularly for those who sit on, to the right of the center. So I think we need to be careful when you say, you guys down under are doing it so much better. We were, but that system is being chipped away at day by day by day. And if I can end on this thought, I'm sure a lot of people now know that privatization generally means there'll be less services and you'll pay more for them. Because really, privatization is going to create profits at the margins. That's what privatization exists for. But if we're going to think of things like public transport and health and education as basic human rights, then we need to run it as a public system. And if the government cannot run out of money, then we do not need to worry about a budget that is going to go bankrupt because these are ideas that are created by ideology that have no foundation in reality. Because if people understood how government spending works, they realize that there really is no such thing as a budget in the first place. So let's just ensure that we look objectively at all systems in all countries um, because I think it's really easy to go, well, Canada does it better or Australia does it better when you know, we're picking and stealing from a lot of different countries and not always to the interests of the people that are going to be utilizing these systems in the first place. We have the same problems that, that America does. Your congressmen have government-funded health care. They will never have to use the public system. Australian politicians have lifetime pensions. They will never have to know what it's like to have to figure out whether or not they can afford to pay school fees or give their kids the, the health care that they need. People are making a lot of sacrifices and it doesn't have to be that way. So if that's what I can leave you with, I hope that people will get a lot out of this conversation. Thank you, I appreciate it immensely. Um, with that, I'm gonna say thank you so much for joining us, Claire. And thank you all, everyone, for joining us as well. And hopefully we will have you back on soon. Be back it's on a wonderful soon. Guest. Oh, it's always great to be on. Thank you for having me back on the show. And I'm around anytime, so call me. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Claire. We're out of here.